All right, smarter cities for a smarter world. Um, I, uh, my name is Jonathan Wetzel, a uh, partner with McKinsey and uh, at the McKinsey Global Institute. I'm very happy to have the chance here to uh, uh, sh spread the good word about cities and smart cities and a better world. And uh, who, who better to spread it with than, first of all, my great friends from the Milken Summit and uh, my esteemed panel, which uh, really brings together you know, a bunch of different worlds, uh, finance, uh, real estate, uh, sustainability, technology, uh, and, and from Asia, from Middle East, uh, from, uh, from the New York area. <laughs> so uh, we've got a lot to, uh, lot to, a lot to go with here. What, but what are we talking about? Why, why this topic? Um, I mean, smart cities is not a new topic. It's been around uh, for a while, uh, and uh, you could you know, date it back depending on, as we'll hear, the definition of smart, you know, literally hundreds, if not thousands of years. Uh, but certainly it's been really hot for the last, uh, last decade or two. And so, you know, is it a real thing? Um, you know, and I, I can't tell you the number of times I get the question, but can you make any money in this? <laughs> you know? So, uh, and uh, that, that's only second to, and how do you do it? Uh, what, what, what is it that you actually have to do to be smart? Uh, so there's still a lot of, a lot of uncertainty here. Um, we uh, at MGI just, uh, I will do the very 30 seconds of promotion, maybe 15. Uh, we just put out a report on smart cities, which I encourage people to take a look at at MGI.com, uh, which would say, yeah, um, we can see the potential. We can see how this makes everybody's life better, literally, as in you live longer, you, uh, you're, you, you use less uh, uh, water, you uh, are safer, your t commute time is shorter, and who wouldn't want that? Uh, but at the same time, not everybody is getting it. Uh, that not every city, you know, at, uh, on a one to 10 scale, cities are getting like a seven. Uh, and so, you know, and, and that's the best one. So everybody has an opportunity to do better. So why is that? You know, what are the barriers and, you know, how do you keep up with all of this? So that's kind of the topic for today. Sort of like, let's, let's really try to figure out what is real about this, where are the benefits, what are the barriers, why aren't everybody getting it, and then, yeah, how do you do it? What are some of the proven ways for the public and the private sector to execute against what should be uh, a better world? So with me, I, I've got, I've got uh, four terrific panelists. I, I think people have the bios and backgrounds, but uh, um, so I will, uh, I, I will just gonna start it off and, and uh, you know, hopefully, as uh, each panelist goes and maybe say a bit about their backgrounds, but uh, you know, large, launch from their perspective on those questions of what, how real is this, and and what does it take to make it make it start? And I'm going to start on my immediate left uh, with Rob Rosenstein, who's as he said, a serial entrepreneur, has been uh, <laughs> building businesses in Asia for decades, and uh, now currently is uh, you know in the travel space, but beyond that, now investing as well in mobility and and uh, other, uh, other digital, uh, digitally enabled platforms. Yeah. Uh, so maybe you can tell, say a sure, bit. Sure, well, thanks, yeah. thanks, uh, uh, Jonathan. The, uh, you know, so I've had the opportunity to live in, um, uh, in Bangkok for 16 years. Um, I started a business uh, called Agoda that is uh, in the travel space. Um, I've traveled around my entire life, I think, as, uh, as a young boy. I never really felt like uh, I had uh, a home, a, a solid home. When I went off to boarding school, that was about as close as I got to a, to a home. And I've always loved travel. And uh, that's what brought me to uh, the energy of the travel industry um, and to the digital side, which has always been a, a great passion for me. And so, you know, I, I think, um, you know, I've had this opportunity to spend so much of my time, you know, in and out of different cities across the region. Um, and I you know, truly believe that we are in one of the most exciting periods you could ever have. And in my new role, as I stepped down from being a CEO uh, after many, many years, I'm now spending my time thinking about investment strategy for a very large group, which is now called the Booking Holdings Group. It's the largest travel company in the world. Um, and I spend my time thinking about uh, transformational businesses to invest in and a little bit, I get a chance to step back a little bit and think about what are the wider implications of what I've been involved in over the last few decades. Um, I have to say, one of the businesses that we invested in uh, recently is Didi, which is a ride sharing uh, platform uh, in China. Um, we've invested in Mitwan, uh, which is a food delivery business. And so I've had an opportunity to really look at um, what some of these businesses are doing as part of my job. I, I spent a lot of time talking to young entrepreneurs at some of the new companies like Grab and Gojek and 
I am just so excited about what's going on right now. The, the problems that we see um, are real and the challenges, but I have seen the efforts of these companies um, making a huge difference in terms of congestion, um, you know, working to you know, uh, improve the way traffic flows. Um, I am excited about uh, what's happening in all the peer-to-peer -peer markets in terms of Airbnb and the ability that that has to create entrepreneurs out of homeowners. And that's one of the things that I'm very excited about. Anything that turns people who might not have been running a business into somebody who's actually running a small business. So, so these are things I'm, I'm very excited about. Um, I do spend a lot of time thinking about what could go wrong. Um, as you, you know, start to work as an investor, you start to think about what can, what can happen <coughs> wrong. So I, I think it's a very exciting time for us. And um, there's certainly lots to talk about uh, in terms of all the influences. And I do worry a little bit about, um, you know, are we making cities smarter for the entire community? Or are we, you know, making cities smarter only for a small percentage of uh, the people who travel into the cities. I'm certainly not uh, a great example when you're flying in business class and you're staying at the you know, Mandarin Oriental or the Four Seasons. I think these are some of the questions we have to ask ourselves. How are we spreading um, the opportunities through these digital technologies? And I think some of the members of the panel really have given more thought to that. But, but that's something that I'm really focusing my time on is thinking about how do we, if you, I used to live in San Francisco and I just felt like while you could use every con, kind of digital technology, the city itself was so broken in terms of have and have nots, you really felt it. That can't be what a smart city is all about. So I think a big part of what we need to think about, and I challenge all of us to sort of think, is how do we take these amazing, empowering technologies and spread them more wide? Okay, so it works, but maybe we're not getting the, everybody to, to use it and to work for them. Yes. Uh, smart for who? Uh, now, Hugh, I'm going to turn to you. So 30 years again in, uh, in, in Asia and, uh, and in the real estate sector and sort of, you know, you see the platforms, uh, literally the physical platforms. What, you know, how else have things changed uh, in, in, from, that, from the BlackRock perspective? Um, well, from a BlackRock perspective, you know, we, we need to, to invest to make returns. That's, that's a very simple uh, fiduciary to our clients. So we have to be thinking and working in environments and talking with groups like this, this panel about how we make sure that we're leveraging the best for those returns. Mm. And real estate's a, a long-term investment uh, from a development point of view. You, you build it for 30 or 40 years, perhaps slightly less in Asia, um, longer in Europe. Um, and so we, meet, we need to maintain the flexibility. Um, we talked before we came up on stage you know, it was 18, sort of 20 years ago when we, we first started to see the internet leverage our lives to the degree that it is today. But we're still in the digital age, but, but how much has that advanced behind the scenes? You know, we, we look at our iPhones and we see enormous leaps and bounds, but we take so much for granted. You know, the Milken app for this conference, for example. <laughs> Everything's just so easy. And I'm sure a lot of us can remember life before the internet. It, it was harder, but we, but we got through it. So I, I build space, or we build space, we, we, we buy space, we convert it. It's my job to create the spatial platform for this technology to leverage an easier life, whether it's work, whether it's uh, a bed, or whether it's, it's playing. But my role in this piece is to provide that spatial solution. And to address the uh, question that, or the, that, uh, that Rob was just raising in terms of that platform, um, is the digital platform creating more opportunities for others? Or, I mean, what's the relationship between the physical platforms that you're investing in and this new digital world, which is supposed to make things better for everybody? <laughs> well, the relationship is quite simple. Whatever technology you're using to, to fulfill whatever requirement, you're going to need it in a dry, roof-covered space. Uh, I mean, that, that's the fundamental of it. Mm -hmm. When I'm building that space, I need to be thinking about how best to provide solutions for that technology, whether it's as simple as just good broadband coverage or whether I'm working with these service providers as part of a, a rental package. So you come and rent from me, whether it's a, an apartment or a hotel room or an office or a shop, and I will bundle these services in a way through a fat pipe or whatever so that you've got the advantages.
So I've got to present, I've got to use this te technology and leverage it to make my, my offering more attractive than, than the next person. So you would say that this technology is going to, if anything, accelerate the demand for your capability to provide that physical space? If, if mm -hmm. the builder and the manager of that space gets it right. Yeah, yeah. okay, which, which, of, which you will. So, yeah. <laughs> so we'll come back on that one. But then what about, uh, you know, as we sort of started to refer to the conversation is around this broader question of how, how does this digital technology affect everybody in the city? You know, Lauren, you're, you're in, in, uh, was in, in the role, I was going to say in the business, but in the, in the role uh, <laughs> of uh, looking out for all of us at, uh, as part of uh, the Resilient Cities program. How do you, how do you see the impact of, of digital technologies here? Well, I think when we talk about the impact of technologies, we have to start with what is the outcome we want? What, what is better? What does that actually mean mm -hmm. in our cities? And um, I've been working as managing director for, for 100 Resilient Cities in Asia now for several years. And we're working with cities from Wellington in, in New Zealand to Pune in India and, and Mandalay and Myanmar in, in between. So what better is, is wildly different depending on what your context is. We have to think about what our cities are facing, right? Our cities are on the front, front lines when they're dealing with climate change, when we're dealing with globalization. So we have to look at what the problems are. So when you want to look out for that greater good, you have to define what that outcome is. And so what we're in the business of doing with 100 Resilient Cities is helping cities to build that vision and to articulate it so that they can then be better sparring partners, have a better ask to those partners, whether they're private sector partners, public sector, academic institutions. There are vast opportunities for partnerships and getting the technologies right, but it is up to the governments to have a point of view and set those frameworks. There's not always a clear capacity to do that. So what we start out with in our program is we, we take cities through a process of examining what are their key shocks and stresses and how could their greatest challenges actually be reframed as opportunities? How can they set a vision for where they want to go in, say, 20 or 30 years? And then what are the key initiatives or projects that will get them there? Um, and so we work very hard with cities to define that vision, but a vision and a piece of paper, I think, is, as anyone who works in this space, are, are not enough. You actually need to cultivate leadership. So I think the other piece of this that sometimes we don't talk enough about is how do we actually cultivate leadership, both at the top level with our mayors, and we see you know, our organization in 100 Resilient Cities, C40s, others ha have really focused on mayors um, in the past um, years, but also that next level down of those senior administration officials to say, what is it that we need as services for our community? And then, and we talked a little bit about this before um, when we were all sitting down together, but how do we reframe the way we develop partnerships and specifically procurement in cities? Because cities have some money to spend, but in a lot of cases, they don't have enough money to deal with the problems that they need. They also don't necessarily know what solution they need. And SMART is an incredible example of that. And if we can reframe what the desired outcomes are, we can change procurement and allow you know, creative enterprises like the Agodas, like the DDs and others to come into that space and to deliver the kinds of solutions that will benefit the most citizens. So I, I hear you saying that, I mean, this, you know, first of all, we have to need to find what's better and, sort of, and that governments don't necessarily articulate that well. They sort of need to have a process and leadership. But from your point of view, so what is better? What can this digital deliver? What's the prize? <laughs> <laughs> so what's the part? I think there, there are a number of potential prizes. We were talking about housing mm -hmm. before this and affordability. Um, I think when, when we talk about the availability and affordability of housing and the needs of um, low-income communities, we've seen increasing migration. Some of it's internal, some of it's international, driven by different situations, climate, political, et cetera. So housing is one area where you can deliver services. Another fantastic area of growth, um, I was in the, the health panel this morning, is on aging. We, we work with the city of Toyama in Japan. You've probably never heard of it. It's a small city on the west coast, about three hours Shinkansen from, from Tokyo. Um, but they have developed a fantastically integrated care center where in their super aged city, their seniors don't have to leave the house to, to consult with their GPs. And they're able to do that digitally. They're not exposed to germs coming in to see the doctors, but they have that interaction. And there are also social benefits of that. Those who are linked up on their you know, sort of senior iPad technology 
also have community groups and they socialize via these technologies. So I think there's fantastic gains in terms of public health in cities. Mm -hmm. There's fantastic gains in terms of housing. And then of course my background and the reason I came to this region initially um, was to uh, help the Asian Development Bank uh, develop their first climate change investment strategy. And so when we start to talk about energy efficiency, um, disaster preparedness, that's where we can see huge gains um, in terms of how we build our buildings, monitor them and their cooling and, and uh, lighting systems, um, and, and also how we respond to disasters. There's a fantastic number of apps and entrepreneurs who are coming in with technologies that make our services more transparent. And they can tell you how long it took your city to respond to your request um, for filling your pothole or a fire. Yeah. So it's about getting the information to get a better decision so that you can get a better outcome as a result of that decision. Absolutely. So the, the monitoring in order to respond. I think that's great. That, that, that helps us focus. Now, Nayef, I come to you as the, uh, wouldn't say the new kid on the block, but the, one of the new, new opportunities, sort of creating the, you know, a city, not from scratch, but with a, the, the, a new, we can, we, can I say, new Singapore in, uh, in the Middle East? And, I think uh, can, yeah. yeah. So as, uh, and, uh, as, as uh, the head of the Urban Planning and Development Authority, how do you see it? What is the role of digital for, for you in this, in this opportunity? I mean, I think I have to start with saying that um, the Kingdom of Bahrain, we have a, a 2030 plan. I think we started that 10 years ago, launched in 2008. But as you know, the plan is as good as the updates. So every five years, we, we sit together, we actually see what has been made, and is it still relevant, I think. As you know, in, in the digital and technology age, a year is 10 years, I mean. Dog years. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's the biggest challenge, because when you go to infrastructure, the investment that we have to put in, uh, it takes years. So we have to be certain that that is what we want to be in five, 10 years. So I think it's put a lot of burden on the executors, be it um, in developing of new roads versus uh, investing in light, light transport. We're discussing now the various modes. So it's, it's, it's a very um, interesting time because we have still a very large growth of population. We're just 1.3 million now. And we're aspiring to accommodate, I would say, triple that in the next 20 years. So to be able to reach that, we need to invest in all kinds of infrastructure, be it the digital, I mean, we are now, from the zoning perspective, trying to accommodate more warehouses and um, storage units. As you know, uh, this is the new age. We've been talking about that earlier. We just uh, signed Amazon for the regional uh, offices in Bahrain. Mm -hmm. And uh, that has been a lot of work to actually allocate all the land. As you know, we're more or less the same size of Singapore, so land is not that much available and even with reclamation, which yeah. we're doing. So <laughs> that's, I think, another struggle we have to put into, putting it all in one plate. And um, honestly, being able to cater for the new needs. So I do agree that the digital age is making things easier, smarter, if you might. But the biggest challenge is to see how all the, let's say, related people interact. So we try to do panels with stakeholders, be it business owners, um, government organizations, and try to review our policies, especially when we talk about we're trying to introduce new waterfront policies, uh, green areas. As we are a desert island, we still have some palm trees, and they are unfortunately, uh, if not being more protected, will you know, just mm -hmm. be turned into another uh, concrete jungle. So I think the balance is creating uh, a, a community that can, you know, talk together and come up with the right approach for its own circumstances. I mean, when you talk about a smart city, I don't think there's one size that fits all. So when you go into each region, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the, 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 how, how people live, how their customs are, might change that a bit. But I think in Bahrain, as we are very small, change is faster. So I'm pretty optimistic on that that we might be able to, let's say, catch up with the digital uh, progress, not uh, 
fall back, hopefully. Well, I mean, that, of course, we were sort of, I was sort of fishing for a positive sort of <laughs> rah -rah, and I think that, that, that gets there. But I also hear you saying, okay, well, this is not as easy as you would like. I mean, we have these long-term decisions. We have a really short technology cycle. And so how do you balance that? There's a lot of stakeholders, a lot of interaction, and just it's complex. So how does digital help you, I mean, and to meet that planning need? Just maybe one or two examples of, you know, I mean, what's to be done honest, better. We're, no, no, I mean, <laughs> there is a big need, a, a, a big advantage of algorithms now mm. if we plan a new area we can factor in where the new uh, train will be landing from the kingdom of Saudi Arabia this is in the pipeline now so just knowing that gives us a clearer estimate of the traffic and footfall around that area which helps us plan accordingly to heights built up areas mm -hmm. so it's it's a bit of more uh, easier let's say with numbers in the past you have to have all the information from various groups. Now we have a, an electronic government, we try to call it. So everything is uploaded in one cloud. And once you put in a scenario, you can get the answer straight away. Mm -hmm. We didn't have that 20 years ago. So. Right. And so, and what you're going to get out of this then is a better community or better use of space or more connectivity or how exactly. do you think about it? <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think the goal is to be more informed. Mm -hmm. um, at the time of making the decision, yeah. uh, be it better or not, I think it's pretty early to say, <laughs> but uh, we hope it is the better decision because as you know, the more informed you are, the better decision you'll make. So I think that's the, the let's say the highest advantage in my opinion of having a smart city. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I hear a common theme then about sort of, again, using the information to make a better decision to achieve a better outcome, sort of as being the logic for why this, why, why this works. So how do you make money at it, you? <laughs> <coughs> well, I, I, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd be a, a fibber. If fibber is an English word for liar, it's a much nicer word than liar. Uh, I'd be a fibber if I said that we make money from, from technology in the real estate space. BlackRock has a technology business, but in the real estate space. But what we do with technology is we create value. And you, know, you can make money two ways. You charge a higher rate uh, for the service, or you, you get people to pay for that service earlier. So you create value. It's the same difference, really. And I'll try and give you some examples, if I can. So in China, we, we had a shopping center in Chengdu. Who knows Chengdu? as a city. It's a beautiful city. Uh, it's got lots of claims um, uh, in China. It was, uh, it's, it's the home of the panda industry. That's probably the most famous uh, claim. <laughs> uh, but it's a 12 million population city. Um, we had a shopping center about half a million square feet. And uh, you know, we were looking at how to, to work with online retail rather than fight it. Um, and we had some discussions. We've sold it, the, the center since successfully so, but we were having some discussions with a technology provider and with the retailers, uh, where if somebody had come into the store and, and was using our Wi-Fi network, our broadband, to compare the prices, so they're looking at a pair of trousers or a jacket in Zara, Uniglo, whatever, they could buy that item in the store using our Wi-Fi, and we would benefit from the value of the sale because our, our deal with the tenant was on a turnover basis. Hmm. So the, the store still gets the sale. In fact, they might be able to upsell as well because online they can offer a, a package deal. We still benefit from the, uh, from the value of the sale in the store. So we, we, we still get our piece of the action. And that's an example of using technology to work with both the consumer and our customer, the retailer, on, on how to, to leverage uh, how, how they want to do business. And the second example would be here in Singapore, and perhaps not so much technology, but I want to go back to that mm. smart con con content. We built Asia Square here, and um, we don't have any air conditioning plants on the roof, which probably comes as a bit of a surprise. We buy our, air, our chilled water from a central a district system. And that, that's an innovation by the Urban Renewal Authority. Um, there's one very large plant which provides chilled water for 10 million square feet. So we buy chilled water. And it's, and it's so advanced technically that if we return the water, once it's been through our buildings, if we return the water above a certain temperature, in other words, if we haven't taken all of the cooling power from that water, we have to pay a fine. 
Now, that's really good smart government. I mean, these are the kind of things that NIAS looking at for Bahrain. Um, similarly, we built two towers. Um, there was supposed to be a road in between the two towers. We went to the URA and said, we'd like to create this communal space. If, if you've been to Asia Square, you'll see it's got this big thing called the cube. And we have uh, seats and tables, and we have concerts and various other things. And we said that we'd like to create this space. And they said, that's a fantastic idea. But it's government land, so you're going to have to rent it from us. Now, in many places around the world, that would be seen as an opportunity to, to make a, a lot of money. But the URA said, don't, don't worry. We'll write a contract, and we'll charge you one dollar. Not a dollar a year, or a dollar per square foot. One dollar for the entire contract for 99 years. Now, that's smart city management. That's progressive city management. So three examples, one of technology and one of just how we as a private entity and a developer need to work with our, our cities and we need to work with our consumers to, to leverage the value. Of that. That's, that's terrific. I mean, a decision making. And I wanted to come to you also, Rob, just from the entrepreneur's perspective. I mean, how does that resonate? You know, I mean, I think um, we have a world of uh, sort of two halves and, and we have countries and cities which have um, professional leadership uh, skills, have 20, 30 plans and I think um, you know, one of the things that I like to think about, having lived in Thailand for so many years where you have had a significant amount of political turnover, um, you don't have necessarily um, you know, a strong uh, foundation of civil uh, you know, expertise. And, and in, even if you did, the, the digital technologies that are happening, are, are, again, their life cycle is so short. And so the question that, that I find myself thinking about lately is, you know, what do we do when it's difficult? In other words, if you've got great leadership and you're thinking 50 years in advance and you're Singapore, terrific, that's a great problem to have. But what happens when your city is maybe not as functional, not as long-term, doesn't have the kind of uh, you know, bureaucracy built in? When it's harder, what do you do? When you're in uh, Cambodia or Laos, how do we do it there? And there, I think, um, you know, my perspective is that um, in those kinds of environments, the private sector has to play a, a much uh, greater role. And, um, you know, I think, you know, this is just the fact that this is where the technologies are. And I think the thing that we should really be thinking about, um, and probably what I spend most of my time thinking, is, is human capital. And you talked about it earlier. Um, you know, not just inside uh, government, but government and the private sector tend to blend. How do we create cities that attract um, the right kind of human capital? And, um, you know, as a, as a business owner, um, an entrepreneur, my success is completely determined by the kind of talent that I can bring into the company. And, and in effect, the city is a vital part of that, uh, you know, equation. Um, you know, there's people often say, well, why do you have such a big operation in Bangkok or KL or London? Or, but these decisions of where to locate businesses, where to build development centers, are probably the most important decisions that an entrepreneur will make in his life. Um, I happen to be um, not a big fan of Palo Alto. Um, and uh, we can talk about that at the bar later. Um, but, but, but the fact is that what does it take to bring human capital into, uh, and you need that to, again, to build that leadership um, infrastructure. And so I think thinking about what attracts families, how do we, because it does really take um, a, a diverse population. I mean, we have so much data. Every country has an unlimited supply of data. We get it from you know, every source. We get it from utility companies, from e-commerce companies. But processing that data and making that data actionable requires really immense expertise, and, and not expertise that you need a couple of people. We're talking about thousands of professional kinds of people, and these people are gonna come from all around the world. So what is it gonna take to bring those people um, you know, into your um, society, into your city, to get them, um, what, what does it take, what attracts them? And, and there's so many different things to think about um, whether it's, you know, uh, whether things are family or pet friendly or what you do about uh, uh, single sex uh, relationships, 
um, that are very important in terms of attracting talent. And I, as a businessman, that's all I think about. So I think the partnership between um, cities and the private sector, at the root level, it's about human capital. And it's about, and in Thailand, we have challenges in education, and we're working on those. But you know, we are starting to build um, you know, our own educational outreach, our own programs to develop and educate. So it starts with young people, but it also starts about how do you bring, you're never going to do it organically. You're going to have to bring talent from all around the world. And that requires sometimes some pretty big changes for government governments to make, and it has to be a top priority, you may not be able to make a 2030 plan. Um, you may not have the kind of leadership, but at least if you spend your time thinking about how to attract human capital, you might have a chance. Let me, let me come build on it. Two, two quick follow-ups. I mean, one, it's sort of to hear you saying that, okay, human capital is the key battleground for a city. It's equally important for an entrepreneur. So that's you know, the, say, that's the war. Entrepreneur city. So is digital kind of table stakes in this? If you don't have a digital, if you don't go and find your mobility app and your Meituan and your, and your healthcare app, basically, I'm not going to go to your city. So. I mean, I don't know the digital... <laughs> Uh, adoption necessarily makes a happy city with uh, economic development, but certainly there are advantages of digital platforms that everybody wants. Yeah. And um, so people tend to measure smart cities by how fast that city adopts best practices that are being used elsewhere. It's true, if everyone is, uh, has access to an amazing food delivery service that's um, you know, environmentally friendly, and it takes your government you know, 10 years to get that, then you're probably thinking, well, my city's not that smart. So it is important, but in its own right, I don't think it's the, it's the end state to, you can have lots of digital adoption and big divides between rich and poor over development, which really impacts, again, you know, whether people want to move to that city, whether it's, you can have an amazing economic development and wipe out all your parks, and therefore people with families don't want to live there, so they, they move elsewhere. So I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a wider um, problem that digital is just one part of, of the issue. Um, the challenge is it's great if you've got a great government sorting it all out. The challenge is when you don't. Yeah, but to that, to that point, I mean, so I, first of all, I hear you say, okay, digital helps. We all live in the real world also, so you can mess it up. But uh, the, uh, the private sector, so the private sector's got to step up, but we just you know, heard this sort of like there's two ways you can make money on this. You can charge people more. You can charge, have them pay earlier. Um, so, you know, in the case of a dysfunctional government or an area where you really don't have them, the private sector must, I, mean, I think the private sector will step up. The question yeah. is, what happens then? Yeah. So, how do you think, how should the private sector step up? I mean, uh, I think the private sector, um, you know, needs a, uh, a garden in which it can grow. It needs to have freedom, um, you know, and it needs to have transparency. And I think what we're looking for um, in the private sector is, rules that we can operate across a level playing field. And the thing that I think cities and governments don't understand very well is, is the, that these businesses require scale. We were talking about this earlier, is it, that we can't do things in a manual fashion that requires us to hire hundreds. So we need platforms and opportunities to do things at scale. So um, as long as governments are able to have that conversation, enable us to operate and grow, um, you know, I think that's, that's really all the private sector needs. We generally do our thing. If you give us that and the ability to hire people, we can, the private sector will emerge. I mean, look at in, in Asia, it's amazing how much, um, you know, innovation has started here. So look at the cities that are, are, are where the innovation is coming from and ask yourself, why is that innovation coming from there? Okay, so Lauren, building on the garden metaphor here. So uh, <laughs> the, uh, you know, you, if you, are working with the city and you get an offer from XYZ digital platform that says, you know, just give me a license. It'll be good. You know, yeah. <laughs> you're going to be a smart city and uh, just let us do our thing. Um, any concerns? Tons. I mean, <laughs> that, that happens all the time. And the reason that we've structured the, the platforms that we have within 100RC the way we have is in order to make that a better conversation. So I talked earlier about organizing the ask on the part of the city. That is critical, and that is step one. If the city does not know what problem it's trying to solve, you can't bring in the technology. At the same time, we've worked really hard with our private sector partners, and I, I see Aero Farms here and a number of others who we've been working with. Um, 
we, we've actually worked with those partners to say, what is it about your business case or your, your model that you can bring in that you can help the city to think through what is going to make it a better place to live, right? Because that's what every city wants to be, a better place to live so that people stay there. And there's that sort of virtuous cycle. Um, so what we do is we help define the ask on the public sector side. And then we work with the private sector partners to say, what is it about your service that's going to help the city to add value in the right direction? And then create a relationship where that pilot is meaningful. Um, and, and what we found that that ability to structure the conversation and have it not just be a one-way um, conversation between you know, business X and you know, the URA, for example, if we're in Singapore, but actually to bring in that holistic and multi-sector approach, that's what drives the value to the next level. That's what we're talking about when we speak about resilient cities and essentially, at a lot of levels, what the smart city framework is evolving towards. If you look at what Singapore in its ASEAN chairmanship has infused into the smart city program, and they now have 26 cities in the smart um, network here, here in ASEAN, it's actually been about smart for what? It's been about what is the value of that. So deriving that and working with the private sector to say, look, we're not just plugging your technology in to solve a singular problem, right? We're delivering value across a number of verticals. Okay, so, but you know, this, if I can keep on being slightly provocative, I mean, we are here as private sector platform providers to make money, and quite a lot of it, actually. Uh, and uh, it holds up the valuation for all of those institutions that, that depend on us. So, sure. um, so, but how do you square that with this idea that maybe not everybody can afford the uh, mobility app? Maybe, maybe peak pricing becomes a, a concern at a moment when there's a, a crisis. So what are the kind of things that you think about as a, as a city to sort of manage that? Uh, is that a conflict or is that, is, that a, is that kind of a false dichotomy? On the one hand, I need to make money. On the other hand, I've got the whole city to, to provide. So. Yeah, I think when, when you think about the, the solutions, you're also thinking about that problem. And there's, you know, such a rise in, in mobile technology. I mean, when you look at the bottom of the pyramid solutions, most people are leapfrogging, right? We all know this. They're, they are holding a mobile device and they're actually able to register their concerns via that device. And so I think there, there's a lot of space to ensure that equity. Again, if the government is setting those rules of the game, I think Rob made an interesting point. Not every government will have the capacity to do that, so you have to choose your entry points. I think there are a lot of really encouraging applications which are helping with addressing in places where there's informality. And so there, you know, what three words is one, Air Nest is another, right, who, who are helping. And so there are a lot of technologies where if you define what the problem is, what you're looking to solve, you can get to those equity issues and you can prioritize those. I mean, then that's part of the role that we're trying to help cities to play. And I think, you know, the, the argument will always be, why would the private sector do this for free? I mean, we work with 100 cities, but there are 10,000 cities. So the opportunity to do some kind of free R&D, if you will, and pilot these technologies leads to the scale play, right? And so there's always going to be that next application. One small pilot to help a city solve a really critical problem um, is only going to help then to unlock other kinds of innovation that will be money making. Mm -hmm. If you talk to the folks, um, you know, at, uh, you know, Grab or Gojek, um, or many of these companies, the, 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 you're talking about very young uh, leadership. And they really do care. I mean, um, they really are, are passionate about um, the opportunities in microfinance, um, the ability to create um, small businesses. Um, you know, I'm always amazed at sort of um, how motivated leadership at these companies is by making better cities. Um, it, you know, uh, and I think that there's a belief that, um, you know, if they are really doing great things for their community, that ultimately there's enough, there's plenty of profits uh, to go around for these businesses with so much scale. So, I mean, you look at, uh, you know, you know, in general, despite all the challenges, um, you know, we were talking earlier about ride sharing. It is, uh, you know, I if I want, had a child traveling, I would much prefer them to be using a ride sharing app than a traditional taxi. Um, I believe that the the management at these kinds of companies are looking for opportunities to create a better world. Um, so it's just about 
you know, giving them that opportunity, this idea of, of being clear about what the ask is and letting the engineers go out and solve for that is, is, is terrific. And it just, this, is, this is the kind of game we need to be in. Yeah, and I hear you. And I think that's, I mean, I, you're a good guy. You're going to share some of that value. I know some guys who are not. <laughs> but I think that's changing, too. I mean, when you look at, I think, some of your own McKinsey studies around employment, they're saying nine out of 10 grads want to make a difference, right? That's the kind of job they want. So I think when you look at the future of work, it's not just leadership, but it's also every employee that's now looking for that opportunity to make a difference. And I think you also see people moving to places, not just that are the best places, but are the places where they want to be part of that delta. And I think that's really exciting. Well, let me come to Nayef. You're a regulator or quasi or in the making. <laughs> so how are you thinking about this? Because essentially you get to set the rules of the game here for how this gets, gets played out. <laughs> I think, I, I believe there has to be a base of uh, interference from government organizations. In our perspective, we talk about zoning and building regulations. Um, in the past, we had very specific zoning uh, entailing, you know, how much uh, elevation you were set out, certain colors, certain facades. I think that was too specific. Uh, in some areas, we're trying to make, I mean, open up the space for innovation more. So we're just setting up a footprint to build, and um, that's it. And you just say you have a built up of X, depending on the location you are, based on the infrastructure services available. And I think that's, that's fair, in my opinion, because you, you have to have a base to be able to deliver the services that they need once they're ready in, in the real estate market. And uh, I think the balance between the two is not to have uh, an overambitious uh, built up and then the government cannot uh, plug it to the electricity or take in the sewer system. Um, we see these problems a lot because sometimes you overreach and um, that's even a struggle as well. So we, we've seen a lot of examples where you know, new cities come up and then electricity shortages, uh, infrastructure, you name it. So I think the balance uh, in, in, in a regulator point of view is to put the minimum requirement to ensure a quality of living, uh, mm. okay. I think to summarize it. Well, I, I, in China, we say that we regulate the outcome, we don't regulate the service. Mm -hmm. Fair so, enough, yeah. Is that a philosophy you would? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> other people do, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when you talk about, I mean, we just started reviewing our waterfront um, guidelines. Mm -hmm. For us, as we are an island, uh, a lot of new developments are covering up the waterfront. So we came up with uh, new guidelines that are uh, just ensuring even views. So when you actually build, instead of covering the full footprint with four stories, just allocate a smaller with a higher uh, gradual built up, so more of the residents can enjoy the sea view and feel that they are in an island. Yeah. Because sometimes when you really build around it, you go in and you're like, I don't remember this place. <laughs> yeah, that, that's Shanghai. So uh, <laughs> the, uh, we're looking where's the high. But uh, the uh, so. But are you going to build for AVs? Is autonomous vehicles? Is that part of it? Um, I, I don't think we're there yet. <laughs> to be honest, uh, I, we're aspiring to be able to let's say manage. We have a separate organization for transport. We just in uh, an, an urban planning regulate the corridors. Um, they have a higher struggle of saying what type of transport would be in those corridors. Mm. But uh, I mean, if I give them 100 meters, they have 100 meters. If they can do all of that in that specific space, fine. Okay. I mean, uh, maybe they two don't highways, maybe one they can, maybe they train. <laughs> okay. so. That would be interesting mm. to see, because the moods change. But as um, Hugh just mentioned, the, the, the need of space doesn't. So uh, that's the, the core, I think. When you talk about the new smart cities uh, directions, uh, retail is not re retail anymore. Uh, it's just a showroom. So I notice now when people rent out, they put smaller grounds and just they require in the zoning more storage room. So this is a, a new requirement and we're trying to address them by calling them special projects yeah. <laughs> because they're not the standard of saying, uh, I will require you know, the conventional re retail space yeah. because as you know, everybody shops online. So yeah. what I see, which is still remaining, is 
entertainment, of course, and food and beverage, but they, just because they need the kitchens. I think that's why they keep the restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> you may, in the future, you might find a warehouse with a kitchen and just an automated screen and just sending out orders, as I'm sure there are somewhere who does that. <laughs> yeah. We've just built it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, this is true. Uh, we have a, 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 an office building with a small resale podium in Shanghai. And we've shut down a restaurant, a traditional restaurant with a kitchen and, and a la an area for people to come and sit and have their lunch. We've now converted the entire space into a kitchen <laughs> so that your delivery companies can just deliver food to where people want it. And we can charge more rent. So we're, that's an adjustment to the consumer demand because of the av availability of technology and the delivery companies that, that Rob has, has, has bought or setting up. So there's a real live example. Uh, so yeah, and the, and the space is the same. The usage changes. So I think the biggest struggle is setting up the new zoning definitions with these new technologies. I mean, if you're, some countries are very specific in naming each activity. And I think investors have a big problem of labeling them into a certain uh, delivery, restaurant, uh, manufacturer, because some of them, there are none or all of the above. Yeah, but my dialogue now is with, with the urban planners <laughs> because I don't need parking spaces for cars because I, people aren't coming to the restaurant. Mm -hmm. But I need access for motorbikes. So all of a sudden yeah. it changes, right? And I need, I need perhaps to create some space for the delivery guys when they want to rest. To, you know, so the, the, it, it has a, so, an impact on what... So we started with the physical influencing the digital and now we have the digital changing the of physical. Of course, and, I, and if I want it to is, have yeah. that digital influence in my building, I've got to provide the physical. Yeah. I'll tell you a story of about, blimey, I'm showing my age now, late 80s, and I shared this story with you last night, Lauren. Um, there's a shopping centre in the southeast east of London called um, Blue Water. It was a lend lease development. It was one of the first attempts to bring a US-style large format mall to the UK. Very, very, very successful. It's on the M25, which is the ring road uh, around London. So it had phenomenal road access for a lot of people. Lendlease did a number of things. It, it opened, it was very successful. And about a year after it opened, a professor from a, a Reading University, and Reading University is a, a real estate university, he wrote this paper and he, he decided, or he came up with the theory that you, if you charged everybody that went into the shopping center one pound, you could stop charging the retailers, the tenants, rent and still make more money. And if you then ask the retailers to reinvest some or half of what they would have spent on rent back into the experience, you would then get more people coming to the shopping center and you would make more money. Right? It's a very simple thesis. Now, the problem, of course, and this is where I'm going to stick my flag in the sand a little bit, <laughs> is that it's very expensive to build real estate. Mm. And, you know, you need to borrow part of the, the cost to build it. And there are no pension funds or insurance companies or banks that will lend you the money off the back of that theory. <laughs> so there has to be a balance. There has to be a balance between uh, innovation, whether it's technology innovation today or marketing innovation as it was 30 years ago, versus the reality of me needing to pay to build that space. But if the experience is good enough... And it is in theory. Enough, now, in, in 20, 30 years time, yeah. there might be sources of yeah. a, a debt available or, or the equity. cost of remodeling who, who, who that. Would, who would bank on that? that I don't bankrupt know. shopping mall into yeah. tiny homes or yeah. <laughs> you know, creative living space. I'll be, I'll be playing golf at a handicap of two or less by that point, so I don't really care. But, uh. <laughs> I, 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 we could keep going. I just also want to get the audience to give a chance to ask a few, a few questions, and I hope that we have microphones, or if not, um, just shout out. So are there questions for the panel? And, uh, otherwise, we'll just keep going. Um, yeah, yeah, right there. Okay. I honestly don't know if there's a microphone. So. Go and attend events. You know, what, how does that play into developing a smart city? 
Yep. How does culture Yeah, I think that's, that's a great question. We, we actually have a collaboration between um, four of the cities in our network, uh, Barcelona, Da Nang, Toyama, um, and Paris, who all have tourism-based apps. And they're trying to learn from each other on how to promote um, the best types of tourism apps. And, and Microsoft, who's another one of our uh, private sector partners, has uh, helped in the development of these uh, in, in the Barcelona case initially. I think now they're They've exited from that. Um, but there, there's certainly this drive towards promoting arts and culture as part of your overall city profile. And so for, for the cities who are thinking about that and how they preserve and then promote that, Malacca is one of our cities who just started the work with us. They're looking a lot to these examples of cities who are more experienced in managing their arts and culture for economic value and for attracting um, top talent and, and learning from that. And they're using technology to really broadcast that value. And places like um, Yonker Street uh, in Malacca, which is the big um, tourist street, um, if I think probably m many of you in the room have been there, um, thinking about how to optimize traffic flows and show one of the best times to visit certain stalls, certain restaurants. I mean, these are places that for, for many years have been the deterrence to going to visit the cultural heritage areas because they're so backed up. But if you can combine the smart technologies both to promote as well as manage these areas more efficiently, um, then you really have a strong contribution to, to the resilience of, of the city. And we have tons yeah. of people who work at our company who are sort of uh, converted from tourist to worker. So uh, we do a lot of promote, promotion and a lot of, uh, a big part of our recruiting strategies at all of our offices around the world are about promoting local culture. So uh, you know, if you look at the expats that work in Bangkok or many of the other big operations that we have, many of them are attracted by uh, you know, culture. And so we do a lot of work to produce videos and blogs talking about how great it would be to come um, have an experience of working in a different place with a different culture. Um, you know, and uh, it's been very effective for us in terms of marketing and attracting talent. Yeah, I can say Woody Guthrie used to have this saying, all culture is a form of plagiarism. So uh, <laughs> the sharing economy works as far as uh, making culture available to all of us. Um, other questions? Yes, right there. I was just wondering, could you give us maybe a couple of examples of cities you think are the most progressive? Maybe going back to the technology side of it, in terms of thinking of the most advanced use of whether it's sensors or whatever, to be able to manage uh, traffic flows, power flows, et cetera. Who's the smartest city? <laughs> um, I'm not in a position to give that prize, but, but I will say that I was absolutely blown away. When you walk into um, Mayor Park's office in Seoul, um, he can actually tell you how many um, traffic jams or traffic accidents there have been in a given day. And he can zoom in to the point in his screen in the mayor's office and show you the uniform and the number of the police officer who responded to that call. Um, and it, it's not just a question of the technology, because certainly um, in, in South Korea and having Samsung <laughs> sitting in, in Seoul, there's a fantastically close relationship between those developers of the di digital technology and government, and they've used it to, to their advantage. Um, but also, it, it takes the culture of using that technology. So um, Mayor Park is also a mayor who uses social media for accountability. So I think for those of us who are watching um, in, with interest, as he and his wife moved from their house into a much smaller house to experience what it was like to live in a low-income housing development during the heat wave this summer. It was a very impressive kind of, some people called it a stunt, but it was a move that he made to show that he had solidarity with the citizens in his city and wanted to understand their situation. And he continually responds to social media, Facebook, sometimes himself, about issues. So there's both an opportunity to create that transparency and closeness as well as manage your city to a really high degree of efficiency. And so I think Seoul is a really interesting example. Um, I'm also from the tri-state area in the US and New York has certainly started to use this technology in its data center in ways um, that I think uh, are very impressive. And there's a number of cities who, who are really advanced in that space. Um, and I think those two are just two examples of it.
Yeah, I, I feel compelled to add that the MGI study did do a benchmarking of 50 cities, and, uh, and we saw Seoul and New York. We, I think the things that jumped out are actually North Asian cities, the uh, Shenzhen, Beijing, Shanghai, really uh, get more bang for their buck uh, and, uh, and are at that world-class level, along with Seoul, uh, but also New York, Abu Dhabi, uh, Dubai, pretty good, uh, London. I mean, so it, it is, to some extent, who you would expect, but I also think there are, there are also a bunch of smaller cities that, are, that, that show up, and there are some interesting things about European cities, not quite where you would expect them to be in, in many cases, and, uh, and other Asians, so it, it varies a lot. So, yep, Scott. Mm -hmm. on, that, on that note, in terms of the balance between private and public sector and this um, growing need in terms of a lot of smaller cities, smaller scale uh, places, that they don't actually have the, the capital to invest into some of the technology platforms. I guess, do you see a, a growing trend with private sector filling that, that void? And I guess some comments on a return of investment to some of those smaller cities. Uh, because you now have, you know, especially the ASEAN Smart City Network, uh, a lot of that is being developed through the private sector coming in to help to invest. And as it grows in terms of the management of the city, I guess I can see that more outsourced in terms of it as an investment platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perhaps I could I could start the answer on that one. Um, if I if I was to tell you that that we invest. To, to make people's lives better. Again, I'd be a bit of a fibber. It's a consequence of our investment activity. We work very hard with our investors to determine how they would like us to invest their money. And ESG is a big part of that at the moment um, across all of BlackRock's investment platforms. But perhaps because the real estate or the real asset platform is very tangible, it's, it's, it's infrastructure and it's real estate, you know, we're working very hard to make sure that when we look at opportunities, you know, we have a, an ESG due diligence process, so the E is environmental, the, the S is social, and the G is governance. Now, we're all regulated to the, the tie with, with governance, so I think we cover that. Environmentally, there are two benefits. One, you save money because you're, you're managing energy more efficiently, and you're creating a better environment for everybody, your stakeholders. So it's the social piece, so how do you then uh, meet the investors' demands on the social side. And it's creating service that the local community can, can benefit from. And I think we're seeing great examples around the region now where we're moving away from that traditional model of you go into the city Monday to Friday and you live in the suburbs Saturday and Sunday. You know, if you look at the, the CPD of Singapore, the long-term plan in, in, in the Marina Bay development is to have a balance of, of work and living and tourism and pleasure and retail and all of these things. And you know, if you look for Marina Bay Sands, you'll see there are sort of great plots of empty land that was reclaimed in the early 1970s. But this was the great vision of Lee Kuan Yew to develop his garden city. And you know, the sites are zoned. And that's where the urban planners come in. They're zoned to make sure that there's a balance, that at weekends, it's not like the city of London or Wall Street or some of the other very famous uh, ghost-like weekend cities that we, we know and, and love. Um, so the responsibility, if I can get back to your question, is, is we're not, it's not driving our investment thesis, and I don't think there are any investors that are being driven by that particular piece. But it's very important for us to respond to our investors' wishes and those investors have investors, and a lot of them are investing their pensions and their health insurance plans and their life insurance plans. So they're very personal, very emotional, and they want to be responsible. They want to show responsibility. So working with that social environment at any economic level is very important, and it's something that we strive to and do. If I can add, uh, I think from the government side, uh, the shortcomings might be financial, it might be from expertise side to cater for these new developments. So what the private sector might try to, maybe this is one for you to try to package, is a smart city franchise. So instead of giving them just the studies, telling them I, I like a, a manual, <laughs> if you might say. <laughs> because I, I see two shortcomings. An app, you want a smart city yeah, Exactly, yeah, yeah. for governments. <laughs> Because it should be the other way around sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> so we need to see it in a development strategy. Because to be honest, studies are amazing. 
But if you don't have a mechanism to actually implement it, it will just look uh, pretty in a shelf somewhere. So I think that's the main issue. Of course, financial restrictions are always a big deal. And most cities can't afford it, and that's a big problem. But I think another issue is getting the right expertise with the implementation tools. That might be the best combination. And that's a common ask that we hear. We have done a lot of uh, work with the government of India and their Smart Cities mission, which is their you know, $30 billion program trying to reach 100 cities to make them smart. And I see Scott Dunn from AECOM. I know you've also done a lot of work um, with India Smart Cities as well. That's a very common ask to have an expertise network and then to work together. And that's something that you know, we're currently working with the National Institute of Urban Affairs in India to develop a practitioner network who will help those cities, who each of those 100 already have a smart city investment plan and projects to deliver just-in-time expertise um, and tools to those cities. Rob, you get the last word. Just um, <laughs> you know, measurements, I think. You talk about ROI. You know, we're early in the phase, and I think cities are probably not measuring the right things. We talked about the ask. So I think hopefully we can you know, help cities uh, figure out what, what they need to measure to understand if they are getting um, the right kind of ROI and so they can understand whether whether headed in the right direction or not. And I think listening to the right people, asking the stakeholders, and, and having a, that dialogue is going to be critical. And hopefully, you know, we can be part of that. Okay. All right. I want to thank the panel. It's been awesome. We could keep going, but uh, Mike will come in here and personally take me off the stage if we don't wrap it up. So, <laughs> thank you thank very you. much. <laughs> thank you.